Alright, what's going on everybody? Welcome to episode 68 of the Weekly Wave. Uh, it's again been a wild ride. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. It means a lot. Uh, this week I have some very special guests on. Uh, my buddy Jake Burns and his band Rockstead were in town for what ended up being a canceled show. But I still got to kick it with them for a little bit, drink some Bud Light on the front porch. So uh, let's hop into the interview and see what these guys got to say. Ba-boom. Compromise. It's it's already rolling. Go ahead. If you're gonna say it though, say it directly into the mouth, in the mic. My wife is gonna be home soon. <laughs> Cigarettes are bad anyway. So, I think that brings us to a fair compromise. If you're gonna smoke that cigarette, it needs to be in record time. So let's go with silence. Three. No, I don't. <laughs> that's okay. I'm so good. I'm well, do okay. we want a shotgun still, or we rather just hop into some shotgun. Bud Lights? I'll do. A, uh, I'll do a shotgun. shotgun. Okay, cool. Let's get, let's, let's get like the keys out. Let's get the keys out. Three in the afternoon. Perfect Come on, time. baby. Never too late. Well, my friends, uh, this is Rockstead. Uh, while we get ready for the shotgun, would you guys go down the line and say your name and what you play? My name is Nathan Anucci, and I play drums. What's up, y'all? My name is Jake Burns. I sing, play guitar, a little bit of bass guitar, too. My name is Jake Riley, and I play bass guitar and lead guitar and backup vocals. Well... I've known Jake Burns here for a little while, but uh, I've gotten to know the rest of these guys over time, um, enjoying the hell out of every show I get to see you guys at. You know, I, I will say, it's it's not totally different from Jake's acoustic set, but like, vibe <laughs> <laughs> You earned it, baby. Have you been they, shaking they it over there? shook that one up. Shake, shake, shake. What if I shook three of these just knowing that's Russian roulette? <laughs> Would you guys forgive me? Don't eat the can. Promise me you won't. <laughs> I love it. Well, <laughs> let's uh, tag out for a second. Cheers, guys. All right, cheers. All right. Man, what's love, my friends? I, I did not make that hole big enough. Foamy. Very foamy. You gotta make it a bowl, man. Very, yeah. Dude, it was the summer of 2006, and Abercrombie and Fitch came out with the first Schmedium line, and I finally felt understood. So I see what we're going for. Schmedium. <laughs> did you guys all go to the Kendall Ooh. Mall growing up? I did. Beat my pants okay. a little bit. The only <laughs> thing, yeah, Jake, Jake or did Riley you? over there, I'm going to refer to him as Riley today. That's his Sweet. last name. Okay. Riley over there didn't grow up around Cincinnati, actually. I don't think. I'm from the Dayton area. So. You better speak up if you're from the Dayton area. They got to know, brother. <laughs> I'm from Dayton. Dayton. I remember no, the Kenwood yeah. Mall, though. I definitely though. went to the Kenwood Mall. I was buying Slipknot t-shirts at uh, Hot Topic. Apple Store, right? It's it is the one with the Apple Store. But also, that Hot Topic was a big part of, like, honest to God, I felt like part of my musical influence was going into Hot Topic and be like, that's a sweet t-shirt. And then you go listen to their stuff, like... We didn't get the chance to flip through vinyl as kids, and like that wasn't fun to do with CDs. They were way too well organized. Mm -hmm. So I would go to Hot Topic for the random influence and replacement studs for my studded belt because that shit can't last. <laughs> this is a bad idea. Hell yeah. <laughs> and bands. Band too. bands. Band bands. I don't bands. know why. The rubber like bracelets yes. with the bands on them. I had a Foo Fighters one. Day to Remember. Oh, yeah. I was I all about the bands. I had a Rise Against one, I think. Dude, me and my girlfriend just listened to that, that, I think it's the second Rise Against album, and she's like, all my friends talk shit saying they sound like the same song all the time. They are definitely not the same. Until I listened to a whole Rise Against album, I probably thought they were all the same song, being legit. Mm. It's so good, though. Dude, they're a good band. Energetic. Sure. I was a huge Rise Against fan, dude. Mm -hmm. The Suffer and the Witness, that album, changed my musical taste completely. <laughs> 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 I feel yeah, like... more beer. The vocal tone of a band like that is so next level and like and so defiant that I can see why if you don't have a taste for it, you wouldn't know. It's like mm -hmm. Iron Maiden, you know what I mean? But like, the genre needed someone that was so distinguishable out of the lineup with that kind of tone. Mm -hmm. I saw them at Riverbend with Rancid. Oh, Holy shit! Sh Rancid awesome. opened up for Rise Against, which was kind of crazy. Hell yeah! I saw them. I saw Rise Bullet? Against open up for. Uh, the Foo Fighters up in Columbus. Don't. That was badass. With Slipknot? <coughs> no, no, Foo Fighters. Okay. Let's do that again. Rise Against the Foo Fighters. Have, have any of y'all ever seen Slipknot? Yes. 
I've That's always wanted to go to one of those shows. Amazing. Man. Yeah. It was. Not I yet. saw him with Joey Jordanson actually. 2009. It was amazing. You know who? Joey reminds me of like some of the best drummers that have ever like come through my life. Just oh. like as a listener, like I don't play, but I can still appreciate to some extent where you hear a guy just wail like that. But the rev from Avenged Sevenfold is the tastiest back of We are these. talking about two of my top five favorite drummers ever, right there. <laughs> just a, same. I did get to see the Rev. You did. In, uh, Dayton once. They. It was with Bull from my Valentine. Oh Actually, hell yeah! I was, was just talking to Bull. I was like, "You ever listen to them?" She goes, "No, I didn't get that far." I was like, "Damn, straight up." <laughs> hell yeah! I actually saw Slipknot and Avenged Sevenfold with the Rev uh, at the same show in 2009. It was Rock on the Range in Columbus. That's an absurd. Like, crazy. I was a freshman in high school. I wish <laughs> I would have taken the opportunity to go to Rock on the Range. I had like some Dude. some bolder, older cousins that like they were going every year and they constantly invited me and I just slept on the offer. But I was also 12 and kind of terrified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my yeah. mom won't let me go because there's boobies. Dude, there <laughs> was a lot of go. boobies. I you remember that. When, when you go there and you're looking at pictures on, online, mom. just trying to figure out, you think it's photoshopped. But it's not. It's a real world. Come on, Mom. Hey, come on, Mom. Good shit. Just don't want me around them boobies everywhere. My mom was taking me to <laughs> Nickelback me right, concerts at Riverbend <laughs> when I was in, like, seventh grade. And at the time, I was freaking into it, dude. Yeah. I was into it. But those were, like, the Nickelback early days. Gets a bad she rap. took me to the Nickelback. She was taking me, like, Disturbed and shit in middle school. I was like, I didn't know how cool that was, like, as a mom thing. But like now I'm like, dude, mom, you took me to a Disturbed concert <laughs> when I was like 12. Yeah, and like, I didn't have very like um, music heavy parents, so like the few experiences you do get of live music, like especially for someone that does this at the um, at the professional level, like y'all do, it's it's hard to say like when it really gets ingrained to you how much the live show means until you're the right kid at a concert and your mind gets blown. Like I went to see Paul McCartney at Great oh. American. Yeah. And and this was one of the first times like I was going to a concert with just my folks. They balled out and they put us on the field, and I'm oh, up there just shit. sobbing with all the VIP older Paul McCartney fans. Man, it was <laughs> I was like 12. Shit was lit. It's amazing. That's awesome. That yeah. is awesome. How old are you? I'm 25. 25. Okay. Yeah. I turned 25 in July. Oh, you're the young pup of this band. Yes. Jake, how old are you? 29 years young. Okay, okay. Does 30 make you feel uh, coming up insecure? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a scary thought, but here we are. I didn't think I was going to make it this far, but hey. Hey, just keep icing your kneecaps. You're going to be able to <laughs> yeah. do this for a long time. You're supposed to stretch, I think. I don't know. <laughs> You're drinking that mountain water. You are definitely supposed to sp- stretch. If yeah. you guys want to have a yoga portion of this, we can get out in the yard, get oh dirty God. for a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I kind of ate Chipotle Pass. earlier. <laughs> you ate Chipotle? It's kind of pushing airwaves and frequencies. <laughs> I think over my lifetime, Chipotle's, like, uh, digestion rate has gone from being, like, a normal meal to being, like, in 15 minutes, my body's like, all right, go. <laughs> yeah. I will say the only thing that has changed as I got older is hangovers. I used to laugh at people who were like, hangovers are bad, because I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. But then 28, actually, was the year that hangovers started becoming a real thing, and I was like, fuck. Do you remember the first one that really hit? Not specifically. Okay. <laughs> I honestly think it was my 28th birthday. Like, hey, whatever I did that day, I should probably remember, but hey. Explains everything, uh, though. Yeah. You're making me feel like an alcoholic. I was getting bad hangovers at, like, 24, 25. <laughs> like yeah, that's when know. mine 28. started kicking in. 28. Yeah, I mean. It's got to be something with, like, everyone's particular body. And probably how much water you drink. Like, let's be real. Like, I used to drink a lot of does. wine when I lived in Yellow Springs. That seems right. You're drinking mead mainly? I, well, no. Mead like, is I would delicious. drink, like, I'd get, like, handles of Oliver's. Oh. Like Oliver's? This, like, sangria. Or, like, oh, some, no. Yeah. Oh, no. I don't practice it. Yes, I did. I did <laughs> practice sangria. <laughs> that's pretty much the same song, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a Weird Al Yankovic cover. Yeah. It's yeah. quite tasty, but very sugar-coated, so. Well, I just remember, you know, I lived with this guy who was, like, this painter, and he was always, like, you're such a child, you know. I watch you drink wine, you make these weird fucking faces. And I had this, like, ambition to get good at drinking wine. Oh. And as I got good at drinking wine, I started to realize, like, those hangovers, those are real. They those are real. suck. Those are real hangovers. Wine hangover is different. So I don't really drink wine anymore now. I prefer a good bush light. 
You know, good, uh, Bush Light. You know. so, good old boy. Bush Light. Let, let me ask you a personal question. Did Bush Light have to do a lot with this new album? No. Actually, no. <laughs> no, I don't drink this much. It had nothing much. to do with this I'm album. Right? More, <laughs> I would say PBR had more of an effect For sure. than, true. than Bush. When not, did you guys start the album choice. process? Had to have been it's early last year. We start we went well when did we go to the cabin? It was like March, right? Uh, March yeah, of so twenty twenty one. March of last year we had like a riding session in the mountains. And that was like the first and that was when we first started morphing the songs together as a band at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's been about a year. So when you say you're going on like um like a writing trip, are you guys starting from scratch? Or are you coming in with like rough outlines, some lyric sheets? Does everyone commute like yeah. contribute to that? I at least for this album, I wrote most of the songs. I mean, Jacob had some instrumental stuff that he sent over my way, mm-hmm. and but I had all the songs written and ready to go. We just had never sat down as a band to like hash out parts. And yeah, stuff, so. cool. And so when you do that, like especially in a remote location, are you guys taking a recording rig up there to do like some light tracking, just practicing. Most kind of drill the shit out of it once yeah. we write it, you know. Really, just use. I mean, like, even with normal practice with a distance, you know, well, just a normal thing. Not even writing, we're going eight hours, seven, six hours a day if we can when we have the time. Yeah. So when we had the time to just, you know, plug in and play till we wanted to go to bed, like we were doing thirteen-hour days. We, we you know. put in some yeah. work. I yeah, mean, yeah, it was sure. like, we're, because we do live all over the place, so it's like when we have time together, it's like, we're here to get shit done. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think that night, we we, we were playing until probably like two or three in the morning. Close, <laughs> well, too, especially when you have songs ready to go and that, like, like we're all agreeing on already on a consistent basis. So it's like once, you know, when Jason's ever 10 demos of fucking all great songs, mm-hmm. it, Helps put the fuel to the fire. So when you get to the cabin, you're just like, all right, you know, this is what, you know, it's good to have a vision of what's happening. But for sure, at the same time, there is another beauty to writing shit from the ground up. But, you know, with, you know, you, with nurturing a sound of a band, you know what I mean? If it works and we all like it, it works. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So committing to that, you know. Especially talking about, like, you know, it, it, I think it's really cool when band members, regardless what position they're in, can kind of catch a muse at a point in time and just kind of put it on a shelf. You know, it sits in your voice memos. It, it kind of serves that purpose. So when you're going into the cabin, you kind of, you've heard some of Jake's tunes. Like, y'all been sent a voice memo with a rough idea or vice versa. So you feel like that's a lot of the fuel on the fire going into that, like feeling like you have all this canvas to paint on, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I record demos at my house, you know, just a simple recording setup. And I throw them in a demo folder, and I just, you know, I rec- record a lot of them and throw them in there, and I say, hey, guys, like, which ones of these do you like? Like, which ones should we work on first, All or which ones do you not like? Like, And so there's a selection. I mean, we even now we have kind of a backlog of I stuff mean, in that folder. I mean, technically, <laughs> at this point, if we really, you know, we, we've sat, you know, we just got done tracking and recording this last album, but, I mean, there's still, like, eight songs right now in the bank. And oh, that's a cool thing. That. Yeah, there's a lot of music I mean, in there yours, that we have mine, and yeah. all of Jake's, like, we got... But it's just cool to be ahead. We could write like, two more albums right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's cool to be ahead because first joining this band, you know, we just kind of, they were teaching me everything and spent a lot of time just kind of harnessing a tight live thing until we figured out what we're going to do with an album as, you know, playing together and... So it's cool, you know, to reflect on this new experience <coughs> with this album. Because it's not Sorry. something that we all had to, like, you know, walk me through for two years. It's well, like something we all did together. It's a lot of catalog when it comes to, like, you know, how long have you had this band, guys? I From think the, the name, the name of Rockstead has been around for, like, seven or eight years. I think, cool. So. And so this is, like, your first high school band, Jake? Uh... The high school band eventually formed into Rockstead. So it was me and two other guys, and uh, and then we graduated high school and got another guitar player. Mm-hmm. And like about a year after high school, we kind of like changed our name to Rockstead, and that's when we started writing this kind of style of music. For sure. So, well, it's it's cool to see how far like 
you know, even just from scrolling through your pages, you know, y'all are the kind of folks have left stuff up so you can see the full journey, especially if you go on Facebook and you just roll through someone's profile pictures. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's it's a grind to get to any point that you can have the kind of, you know, touring radius that y'all have established and work really hard on to have the kind of gig environments that you do. But when you get kind of eras of bands that really click, click with the way you guys have, it's a lot of catalog to grab onto and a lot of personality to kind of harness and digest as a group and come out with this live show. Mm-hmm. So when, when you guys are sitting on eight tunes that are untracked in just this batch for the album, did you guys like, start experimenting with those live? Like, did you play those in the cabin and opt not to? Or were those kind of like left just untouched? Yeah, I mean, most of them we have not played live. But yeah. there have been, you know, one or two that we kind of filtered into the regular set uh, just as like a sneak peek you know cool and uh maybe well we played one on on special occasions we've only played it like once or twice live so and what's it like to to break it up a little bit and try that do you like going out on that so far i can't wait to start playing all the new songs (laughs) we are very excited we've been playing the same songs kind of for like we we really i think with you know timing everything properly and you know, making sure we're not rushing ourselves on this album and still playing live shows with the older tunes. It kind of really helped us get creative with, like, what we're going to throw in live, like, covers or, mm-hmm. you know, just shit like that. And, like, or, I, like, transitions or different yeah. intros and stuff mm-hmm. into songs to keep people on their toes a little bit. Yeah, what, what's the Beatles cover that y'all did at ISIS? Oh, uh... She's so heavy. She's so, so heavy, heavy. Yeah, dude. Yeah. What a moment! Like, <laughs> so I love that song. This is a, a spot in Asheville that I I was just kicking it down there for the weekend, and it turns out that y'all had a, a banging, you know, pseudo hometown show for you, and it's an ideal room. I'm sitting up on the mezzanine, just straight bird watching y'all, uh, <laughs> with my lady having a great ass time, and you went into that, and like the, um, the texture of it kind of just changed the whole show, cause playing the kind of music you guys do like the show's tight as hell like it snaps the whole way through and for a couple of minutes we went so ambient you know mm. and so wide we get loose on that one it, it was so cool man all about the groove you know i fucking love the beatles you know yeah what? Well, especially when you get to do it your way you know exactly yeah i think we rock it up a little more than you know the beatles track because we don't have an organ but player because that organ fucking slays on the record <laughs> totally yeah. but you know what so when you guys play that role as guitar players to get ambient like an organ, like it's hard to have that texture, but there's ways you go for it, you know, whether it's a wah and some delay and like just some seriously thick chords. Like when it comes to a two guitar player setup, like I know y'all are, you guys constantly kind of blend the configuration, play bass a little bit, play guitar. But when you guys are both sitting in that same meaty range, how do you play around each other? I mean, I do mostly rhythm stuff, so. You know, it's a lot of, it's either chunky power chords for me or, like, high-end, like, you know, reggae chucks. So, Jacob plays a lot around two of those things, I feel like, in my opinion. I mean, really, when it comes to, like I said, we've spent so much time playing, like, the tunes we have been playing, like, in so many different ways, like, bass and guitar, whatever. Really, I just think of it as, you know, what what works and what's not in the way being kind of like a like yeah i play the guitar but i kind of treat like lead guitar as like auxiliary yeah you know what i'm saying just kind of being picky and pokey with what i'm doing and it's where i'm doing it the sprinkles on top for yeah. sure you know cuz jake's got a good tone and you know he's got good flow and you and you want you know, if it, like oh, I said, shucks oh, oh. <laughs> when shit works come on. you don't want to fuck with it you know what i mean it's just yeah. like we click like that. It's like we both have that understanding of like that sounds good, so don't fuck with it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, well, and we've also learned how to play together. Just because yeah. like I've always been comfortable doing rhythm stuff, but now we're starting to figure out like what dual we call leads. what we call guitar manies. Yeah, yeah guitar you know, manies. and like just yeah, dual lead stuff, and um, especially now that we're kind of like running some three piece stuff. Like I definitely have to step up and do some more lead things, but yeah, he's a we're good gonna be playing Event Sevenfold pretty soon, so <laughs> let's watch <laughs> out, baby. Yeah. I love being on the bass, man. I love playing the bass guitar. I love being a part of the rhythm. Well, I wanted it's to ask you about that. You know, wh- place. what's it do for your understanding and like, and your spot in the song to to bounce from being sprinkles 
to being straight meat and potatoes, dog. You know, like having to carry the low end. And it's one thing to be a guitar player and lock with your drummer. It's another thing to be a bass player and lock with your drummer. That's true. Well, and I to played, sing on that. Yeah, I played two bands with Nate. So yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I think me and Jake have enough chemistry together that he could play any instrument. I probably <laughs> I could play the piccolo with Nate probably if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Piccolo solo. I'll be soon. back for this. What, what we <laughs> So we played. Uh, you played banjo with me all, a couple times. No shit. Banjo. Yeah, yeah. It's like this dude's a wizard. Any string instrument, you just hand it to him. He'll be like, not lying. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> so have you always kind of had that gift that when an instrument hits your hand, you're gonna figure out something to play on it? Well, so when I first started playing guitar, I like wanted an electric guitar immediately. Yeah. I was like six years old, and uh, my dad's buddy like. Put my guitar and drop D, my little fucking little fucker, you know, shit beater guitar. <laughs> and dude, Say worse I things started. Guitar, dude. <laughs> I started fucking slamming. You know, I started slamming power chords and you know, drop D. When I'm six years old. My dad, look at this shit, you know, wow, 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 you know, hitting these chords and you know, trying to figure it out. And he's like, I don't want you to have let your guitar to your older. And for some reason, it just made me break down to like, I'm gonna, f- I, I'm gonna just gonna fucking, it doesn't matter if I have electric guitar or not, I'm gonna fucking practice every goddamn thing that comes to mind on this acoustic. Yeah. And my grandpa bought me an electric guitar when I was like 10 years old, and after that, it was just like, I don't know, it was over. It, <laughs> I, I just started listening to the radio and playing to the radio and just, you know, practicing every day. It's what I had. And. Once you kind of, I don't know, and you know this as a guitar player too, it's like, you know, once you kind of get it on the guitar, it's very universal. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make everything seem so foreign. Yeah. Except for the mandolin. I cannot stand the mandolin. Dude, I actually recently just got a mandolin. Did I saw it in there. I'm like, what the fuck was that? It's from the 80s, and apparently it still has the original strings on it. Poor I got mandolin. It. Yeah, I can smell yeah. it. <laughs> I got it Crushing from uh, my drum student, the the older gentleman I've been teaching drums and uh, he's just got a bunch of shit in this house That's so he's getting it rid of it and I was like I'll take that mandolin that's fucking sweet for sure for sure. So kid, give me that mandolin strings, uh, I just got it like Thursday so nice. I'm gonna get some strings for it and get banging oh yeah well that was yesterday. I'm that was sure yesterday. we're about at the time is there anything you guys want to add on the way out for the folks of the wave um I'd say look out for the new album. For sure. Uh, gang, gang. If you we guys aren't doing anything, I mean, wh- when are you post to this? It will come out next week. Oh, damn it. I was yeah. going to say, we're playing at Fountain Square tomorrow night. If you missed it, you missed it. But Sorry. I, I, I'll share the post <laughs> at least just to let some folks know. But, like, yeah. I can't edit like that, dog. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to compress you. these vocals. I like got out for you. the new album. We got, uh, we're, it's done. Going to be dropping it this summer sometime. So. You. Very plans? excited about that. Definitely going to be touring. We're doing a big 420 show down in Virginia, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, we're going to be in the Midwest in May, Northeast in May. Um, Philly for the be, first time. Yeah, Woo. we're going to be hitting not uh, or yeah Philadelphia this summer for the first time. We're doing Pittsburgh. We're we're going to be doing some festivals. We're playing uh, Olmsted Music Festival, and there's another festival that we can't say yet. Nice. But livestock. it'll be great. We got Livestock. We got in Livestock May. Music Festival in Indiana in May. Monkey Mountain Boys, Joe Hartley and the Rainbow Seekers. That is sick. It'll be fun. So a lot of stuff. We're going to be busy this summer, and the new album is on the horizon. we got some cool music videos and uh, some feature artists. It's going to be sick. Cool. Well, thanks, for, be letting sweet. Me, thanks for letting me stop by, boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hell yeah. Anytime. You guys want to jam for a little bit? The hell yeah. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Peace. Peace. That's Rockstead, everybody. I love those guys. Uh, Jake is based out of Asheville, North Carolina these days, and we actually have a show together, I think, in August. Uh, I will have to double-check that, but just got add to the calendar. It will be on these summer tour dates, and it will be our first duo show, I think. Besides maybe the Monday's Muse, which he's done a couple of times. But speaking of the Muse, oh my god, last night was so killer. I can't wait to show you guys next week's episode. Uh, I had Deej, Matt What a Guy, Tommy Lee, Kevin Fox, uh, Sony Grappone. It was it was a killer lineup for the night. And shout to Latitude for always allowing us to come in there and burn it down. Funky stuff, funky stuff. 
Well, I'm filming this on Tuesday, opening day for the Reds, uh, and I'll be playing tonight at Mount Lookout Tavern. So it's a, it's a good day for the city. Uh, it feels like everyone's popping off a little bit, and the summer fever's getting a little bit of everybody. So uh, all the good things, and you know, as as our summer tour starts to fill out more and more, and we start to hear from more excited folks about coming to the shows, it just makes me happy. So. Let's go ahead and hop into some of these summer tour dates. Uh, make sure you RSVP on my website. Check it out for tickets, mattwatersmusic.com. Or you can go to linktree.com slash mattwatersmusic, and it'll take you to everything, including Spotify, the merch line, the big crash, whatever you want to see. All right, let's see. Uh, this week, uh, I'm going to be playing Wednesday night in Indianapolis at the Tin Roof uh, from 9 to midnight. Uh, Thursday the 14th, I'll be in Lexington, Kentucky, playing 6 to 9 at their tin roof. Friday night, everybody, you can catch me on Cincinnati's Fountain Square with my band, The Recipe, and The Grove is opening up for us. These guys are some of my favorite people in the city. They're a kick-ass band. They just put on their annual event called The Rock and Revival, which raises a lot of good money for cancer research. Um, Adam and his brother Matt are just some kick-ass songwriters, and we've been buddies since I was like 15, 16 years old, so I can't wait to get down with them. Also, shout out to Courtney for getting us on that stage. Cincy Music, always supporting, making sure that the local music scene has a home to get down in the summer. So, remember that. We go on at 9 o'clock. The Grove, I think, is on around 8. Free show. Bring your chairs. Come kick it. Hopefully, it's warmer than the last time we played Fountain Square. That's for damn sure. Um, the 22nd of this month, we're going to be back in Louisville, Kentucky, 8 to 11.30 at the Tin Roof. Uh, the 28th of this month, I'll be solo acoustic at Little Miami Brewing Company from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, the 29th, I'll be at Liberty Center out in Westchester uh, for one of their summer kickoff events. I'm not sure exactly what it's for, but they do have Dora, so you can get a drink, go for a walk, come kick it with us for a little bit. Uh, the rest of the dates are obviously on the poster. They're on my website. Tickets are available for everything. Uh, and that concludes episode 68 of the Weekly Wave. Uh, and make sure you tune in in two weeks for episode 69. We're going to be bringing back one of our original guests, one of my best friends. But we're going to leave it uh, a sweet secret till then. All right. Peace, everybody. <laughs>